His legacy will be as one of the forefathers of, of the gaming world and took it literally from A to Z. I mean, I don't think it can be understated what Metal Gear's done for pop culture, for gaming. Metal Gear really took these really difficult concepts and kind of made them easy to digest in a fun video game. I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity to have been a part of the Metal Gear Solid series. What I expect from Kojima is to have a vision and to do whatever it takes to deliver on that vision. This franchise has informed so much about not only the kind of game that we make, but the way that we make a game. Only a game with this kind of legacy can afford this excellence. Mr. Kojima kind of arrives uh, the first time I met him. He arrives almost much, much farther ahead of his physical presence. He's, well, obviously he, Hideo is, a, uh, is really rewarding to work for because you know you're working for one of the best. I think Kojima's a uh, great guy, super talented, you know, love to hang around with him. You know, sometimes we'll, you know, when he's in town or something, we'll go to dinner, just talk about games. He's, you know, clearly he loves the industry. He loves what he does. He's so passionate. It's just, you know, great to, to be around people like that. We're very much ones who try to be one-man armies. Uh, he's very idealistic, as I am. よくこう作品に、すごい作品があって、その影響を受けてまたこんな作品もあって、こんな作品もあってっていう風にこういろんなこうその影響みたいなことがあったりしますけど、このメタルギアソリッドに関してはそういうこう後の影響とか追従がも
and uh, and a sort of a free flow reflection about life and characters that you that, that were significant to you and it was really a very poignant uh, very expressive almost poetic moment that I think uh, at that point and after that in many ways you haven't seen in a video game The nuclear weapons disposal facility on Shadow Moses Island in Alaska's Fox Archipelago was attacked and captured by next generation special forces, being led by members of Foxhound. My first exposure to Metal Gear was, of course, PlayStation. For me, it was a revolution. The first time I remember playing Metal Gear is on the, on the PlayStation. E3 in 1997, when the first Metal Gear Solid was coming out. I must have put about 15 hours minimum into that demo. Metal Gear Solid arrived around the time that 3D graphics were starting to become a thing for console games. And for me, playing that for the first time and seeing Snake infiltrate underwater, it was really special because the way Kojima used cameras to sort of create a cinematic feel for the game. Dealing with emotions I had never seen from a video game before, well, you know, sitting there over Sniper Wolf's body, us two high school boys sitting there like, oh, it's okay, it's gonna be, don't worry about that, we're gonna be okay. You're a hero. Please, set me free. I have two young stepsons, and they were huge fans of that game. Uh, and it was something that I became aware of because I used to have to try and drag them away from the TV if it was dinner or something like that. Some other type of game, just run in, start, you know, shooting people, it's just, no. You know, I spent hours on a scene finally, you know, realizing, okay, look, this, you, you gotta attack this like you would in normal life, you know, and that, that's what made it great. That iconic sound when you first get caught, when you're trying to stealth, and that you know that sound and the exclamation point—it's just one of those things that kind of stands out in your memory. So that's you know one of my earliest kind of iconic memories of, of Metal Gear. I think Metal Gear has influenced the game industry in a lot of ways, and one of the key ways is to have game designers think about their game from a filmic angle. That's not to say games need to be movies, because the games and movies are very different mediums, but if you can view your game through the lens of what would this look like if a cinematographer were working on it, what if you had a AAA type of composer that plays the right music right when you're going to fight the, the last boss? Just knowing all the technology that goes into it, I mean, I can take a camera and put it somewhere with two people, you know, he has a whole force of programmers after that that has to basically go from his commands to putting it together. But that mindset must be very fascinating, the understanding of what is doable. What? My hand! This one hit me like you, you can still play. It doesn't take you away from, from the game, but you're following a story. I played it multiple times on PlayStation, and then with MGS2 as well. Uh, one day, a package arrived in my studio. I was busy trying to be a film composer. I was, it was early days for me. The CD had on it examples of my music from The Replacement Killers, and actually music I'd contributed to Armageddon, Enemy of the State, a few action films. And the letter simply said, this is how I want my game to sound. Are you interested? And you know what? Flattery will get you everywhere. Oh, yes, was the answer. I remember being at the E3 conference in Los Angeles and seeing the demonstration of the game then, when it was Solid Snake on a boat before the Raiden reveal, and just that. Dee -dee 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 -dee. It is still, in my opinion, one of the top three video game scores of all time. It was for Sons of Liberty. He wanted to do like a big title sequence, a completely animated title sequence, and not just um, cutting together game footage, but creating a lot of new content. You know, I, re I remember the idea of like this sort of double helix of DNA, the, the shapes of the scales of the snake skin, and trying to find these sort of uh, symbolic juxtapositions in the, in the opening credits. I remember going and visiting him in Tokyo after Metal Gear Solid 2 had shipped, and the office is dark. There's only one light on. It's Kojima in the corner. Everybody's on vacation, and he's sitting there planning out the story and the scenarios for the sequels.
Metal Gear has a crazy story, and every time there's a new game, I have to come back to find out what's happened. Every game jumps around maybe 10, 15 years, and it's always a chunk of time you're missing. So when a game comes back and is sort of talking about that missing part of the timeline, it's impossible for me to resist. If Hideo has asked you to do Metal Gear Solid 3 because we hear there's gonna be one, so, you know, we did this thing on an oil tanker, we did this Metal Gear Solid 2 thing, and, you know, go, go set it in the jungle or something, I might consider it. Hey, you set it in a jungle. I, I don't think he did it because of me, but, you know, it was, uh, it, was, it was a new challenge. So, with each game, there was a new challenge. The Philosopher's Legacy. Really, when I started seeing how he story-wise used his camera to really make it like a compelling structure, how he would cut it, how he would move the camera, the subjectiveness, the excitement, the way of using music. What a fear in my heart, but you're so supreme. How well do you have to know me to trust me? Eh, Snake Eater, no, I no, zuto agatte kuto koro. I no, asoko wa, eh, to zuto agatte kuto koro de, de beta na enshitsu da na to motte. Na, mo, kon na enshitsu shichatte te omotte rin da kedo, demo zuto agatte kikoete kuru uchi ni kigatsuku to naitsu da. But I don't know why, but uh, I was crying. I feel that Metal Gear's impact on pop culture has been a very impactful one from the fact that it's introduced kind of the idea of American and Western globalization and kind of military industrial complex to an entire generation of gamers and those who are friends with those gamers. I mean, we never really thought about private military contractors or you know, the future of what could happen with soldiers and nanotechnology and augmented soldiers and all of that craziness in there. And Metal Gear really took these really difficult concepts and kind of made them easy to digest in a fun video game. Yet again, our paths cross. So, the bump is something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is very similar to the bump. It's something that is あのゲームをやってるとかこんなんだよっていうのをですねシミュレーションで見せていただいたんですけどねこれ映像だけ見てもすごいのにその世界で入ってゲームなんかした日にはですねとても危険だと思いましたほとんどあの本当に戦場にいるというかですね臨死体験したんじゃないかっていうようなあのぐらいの体験をあのする感じがしましたゲームIf it becomes a big franchise, you know, big hit series, it's much easier to go the safe highway, right? You don't want to go to the dirt road, and you never know, you know, what's what's waiting there. So, uh, but uh, Kojima-san seems like he's never afraid of that, and that's big credit as a creator, artist. By the way, Snake, 
We're changing your code name for all following communication. What's wrong with Snake? Just a precaution. You are now designated Raiden. I played the demo for Metal Gear Solid 2, like a lot of people did, and you went through the tanker mission, and it was great. And so, you know, it's kind of a long prologue, and so when the credits start coming up and you actually start to play what you're thinking is a real game, um, I just kind of rolled with it. You know, it was kind of cool, because you're like, oh, great, this is like such a new experience from the demo. That's, it's a totally new character. That's great. The name of their leader is Solid Snake. The hero of Shadow Moses? So that's why you changed my code name. It was a huge deal to play as Raiden. Are you kidding me? Because for me, it was, all, it was just, it was like that first like 15 minutes of like, all right, when's the other shoe gonna drop? When am I coming back as Solid Snake? Oh, okay, it's an hour in, when's it gonna happen? Two hours in, three hours, and then you're like, holy crap, this is the game. As, as cool of a character as Raiden is, to me, to me, it's always been Snake. And it sort of starts to dawn on you that like, wow, this is, this is not going back. You even meet Snake through sort of the alias that he uses and you kind of realize, okay, I'm not going to play him. Whiny little jerk who just sits there and cries all the time with his blonde hair and all this other stuff. But it was, it, for me, it wasn't, you know, a deal breaker. Interestingly, at first I felt a bit negatively about it. Um, it was kind of hidden for a while, wasn't it, I think? Um, but, uh, I actually think the game's a lot better for it. Why don't you just let us handle the grunt work? You can tell us what to do over the radio, like in the original mission plan. One of the very interesting things that happens in the Metal Gear Solid series is that you as a player may have certain expectations about what's going to happen, but uh, the games rarely turn out as you think they will. I was aware when I started these things that that Hideo was, you know, he was a, a tricky one. He was switching things up. He was always trying to fool the audience. Um, and uh, musically, I had, to, I had to be careful what I was doing with him and, and follow his lead. It wasn't so much a kind of like a, oh no, a snake on it. It was more just sort of like a, how on earth did you kind of keep that secret? You know, it's kind of like, that's, that's the kind of, uh, it's, it's almost like a sort of magic act, you know, the ability to kind of hide something that big. When the tinker ends, then we come in and it's like, why are they redoing the opening of Metal Gear Solid 1 and you rip off the mask and you're not snake? That was an awesome moment and then it became, all right, well, why am I this guy? Who is this guy? What's happening? How is the Colonel still here? It's fun when you don't know what's coming. We want to be surprised, man. So, so the fact that he can take these risks and trust himself to, to make it happen. You just fall down the rabbit hole so easily with any one of these games, right? Where the story just gets out of control and you want to know what's coming up next. Like all of his choices, a, a very bold one, um, to take that risk, um, and the game, you know, obviously turned out to be amazing. You know, looking back now in 2015, I thought it was a, a great move to, to make that switch. Um, yeah, at the time, I'm sure, like many people, I was like, give me Snake. <laughs> and I think the ability to make these drastic changes in a game comes, you know, like, the farther you get into a franchise, the more people are willing to accept some change. Doing it early on just shows, you know, like, how seriously he takes that ability to kind of tell a story more so than just, you know, ship something that people expect. You know, you're putting this character who you always play as, you know, you're viewing him from a different perspective and it gives him more, I guess, it grounds him more as a real character and you can see how skilled he is compared to someone so new. If you run out of ammo, you can have mine. You got enough? Absolutely. Infinite ammo. <laughs> The boss scenes were just nuts. It's so tough to pick, like, a single boss from the series. They all stand out. I, I want to give shout outs to, I think, Psycho Mantis, obviously. That's the one I guess most people will go to straight away. It's got to be between, in terms of the mechanics, it's got to be either be between Psycho Mantis or the end. And the way that you can beat him by messing with your PS2 clock. I mean, when I fought him, it was this incredibly long, drawn out thing. I was really bad, like, I couldn't find him any time I did kind of finally catch a glimpse of him, I'd get too excited and mess it up and have to go and find him again. Like, just the whole time-based thing as well, how you can beat him if you just let him die. And I remember approaching that very carefully and sneaking around, and it took me a long time. You know, certainly, I never thought to, like, reset my console clock or any of those little tricks, which are just great that they're in there. Kill him of old age, 
Um, it's just like one of the mad, I mean, that is one of the maddest bits of sort of technology use ever. I know, you know, I, I don't think that's sort of been bettered as a kind of trick. Um, I just wish I'd known about it first time around. I guess like the, the, the best fights are the ones that sort of almost play out like puzzles. I mean, boss battles, there's so many. You talk about, you, you want to give Gray Fox a shout out, of course, just because remember how amazing that was. It looks like they were cut by some type of blade because this just ghost is going through, tearing people in half. The one guy's like crawling out at the end of it. And then you get to that fight with him and like, that was so terrifying of him popping up over there and you're trying to figure out how to get him. But then to jump forward and then have Rodden pick up that image and then have in Metal Gear Solid 4, he gets stomped by Ray or whatever. But then you get to pilot Rex and it's a Rex Ray fight. I was like, holy crap, is this good. It's not over. Not yet. Originally fighting the Rex. You know, something like that. Just, you know, that first time you do it, it's just like, you know, so impressive. And then, you know, it just kind of blows you away. Snake, your blood will be the first to be spilled by this glorious new weapon. Um, the sorrow as well, I think it's really clever, given that it all depends on how many people you've killed up until that point. Pretty much any confrontation with Ocelot, but maybe that's just because I like those confrontations. It's just you and me. No one to get in our way. Ocelots are proud creatures. They prefer to hunt alone. I think my favorite boss battle, and I'm probably not alone in this, is like the 15 minute epic long battle scene between Snake and Liquid um, that just goes on and on and on and on forever. Uh, it's got this beautiful like John Woo-esque you know, amazing fight choreography and the back and forth between, you know, stabbing each other with the pens. We are beasts created by man. Life's end, isn't it beautiful? It's almost tragic. If I had to pick one boss above all others, it would be the boss from the end of MGS3. Uh, not just because the fight that you have, I mean, that alone is, is amazing. The CQC fight is really memorable, but just the meaning that's layered on top of it. Like, this was your mentor. You know, she was everything in that story. I raised you. I loved you. There is nothing more for me to give you. All that's left for you to take is my life. You know, Snake will, as best as he can, kind of develop some kind of affection for a character uh, and then he will either have to kill them or watch them die. It was heartbreaking to play that and you know see it through to its conclusion because I didn't want to go the way that did. it did. It was inevitable. I knew it had to be done but I was kind of torn up inside when I was doing it knowing that you know the outcome was kind of inevitable. There's only room for one boss and one snake. We met up here in L.A. about seven or eight months ago, and he took me to his studio here in Los Angeles and kind of introduced me to the future of what he was going to be doing. Hideo is not just an innovator with his gameplay, he's also an innovator in how he markets his games. And I've had a great partnership with him over the years uh, for some of his reveals, like The Phantom Pain. Uh, you know, he spent 18 months putting together a fake development studio, Moby Dick Studios, just to toy with the fans for that reveal at the Video Game Awards. When I first saw the uh, the trailer for Metal Gear Solid Five, um, uh, I was just blown away. Well, watching that trailer, it was I was really struck by uh, the tone of it. You know, certainly like the sounds that were used, uh, obviously the graphics and stuff. And you know, I can't say that I instantly thought, okay, this is the new Metal Gear game. But I certainly that was my suspicion. And you know, obviously when the theories started coming out and stuff, I was definitely on board with a lot of that, uh, which didn't take long. Metal Gear Solid V wasn't revealed as Metal Gear Solid V, it was revealed as The Phantom Pain, which is the subtitle that applies to the major game. We had to find a way to cut the letters in The Phantom Pain, have these little indentations, so that those indentations later on would hold all the characters from 
Metal Gear type. And um, we thought we were so tricky. You know, we thought that uh, nobody was gonna figure out that that was the space for the T and that was the space for the P. I went to like all the different forums and I was following all the conspiracy theories and watching them like piece together like little hints. Like there was something like in the lettering, there was like the negatives that spelled out like Metal Gear Solid Five. And in like four hours, there's all these, you know, hundreds of people on the internet like trying to like line things up. You see this? Diamond dogs. Metal Gear Solid V, no trace of my theme. Hideo wanted to go that way, <laughs> which is cool. Enough's enough, you know? Two, three, four. We lent on that theme, we mangled it, we did this with it, we did that with it. People were dying to it, people were being born to it, people were being murdered to it, people were being shot up to it. I produced the music for this new game, but the composer is Justin Burnett, who's a kind of a, uh, someone who's worked with me, under me, on many of these things, so he knew the ropes anyhow. And uh, it's going to be really super cool. I think the fans are going to be really happy about it. Solo infiltration of the Soviet main ground forces. Should be the perfect one. How big is this game going to be? You know what I mean? Like, Metal Gears are linear. We know, you know, I'm on Shadow Moses. I'm, I'm in Metal Gear Solid 4. I'm sneaking around this, like, destroyed area. But there's a point A to point B kind of thing. And when they pull back and they show the map for the first time, and it's like, go anywhere. Do whatever you want. Like, there's guys everywhere. You can fault them out. You can go do this. It's just like, what the hell is happening? Like, how did they take what I love about Metal Gear and put it into an open world? Well, for me, the Phantom Pain and that whole character of Snake is one of the prime examples of using what I come from, which is storytelling from a movie perspective combined with an interactive perspective. I'd say what brings me back for each new installment of Metal Gear is first off to see how crazy it's going to get, and second off to see how Kojima's going to top himself and how he's going to pick up where he left off, because each game feels like it could be almost its own chapter, like he's wrapping it up, but then there's always another story to tell in the series, it seems. Knowing that his vision is to make this open world, or at least open area, where you can kind of explore more, and, and to, I know that that's going to be his focus, and he's going to put emphasis on making sure it's good. So I'm 100% bought in. I can't wait. I was more fascinated by his idea that he was actually very consciously forcing you to make choices through the story. All I would say is it's important that people revisit Ground Zeroes again just before The Phantom Pain comes out. They may have played it last year and played it extensively, but I think it's going to be quite key to dive back in in the weeks or, you know, a month before the final game comes out and really rinse it once more. You know, it's, it's Kojima's last Metal Gear, right? So it's kind of like letting the players loose sort of thing. When I sat down to play Ground Zeroes, I think the first reaction was just my pride and how much it hurt. You know what I mean? Like, it's not as easy as it was where I could walk somebody through Metal Gear Solid 2 on the phone. Now it's like, you know where those guys are going to be and what they're doing, but you might make a noise here. You might hit a pot over there. This is going to happen. Like, you open a door too loud. There's all these little things that it's like, OK, it's, it really is the next level of Metal Gear. What do I do with that? When you have so many, so many mechanics to play with and you have control over things like a day-night cycle, which can totally impact the way you approach a mission, for me personally, I think for fans, it's really exciting. But I think it's also going to impress people who maybe weren't fans of Metal Gear in the past, because it's not so focused on sticking to the tropes and the cliches that Metal Gear is known for. It really breaks out of the box and does something totally new. The small details that he really cares about, which, you know, like myself, that's what makes a big difference. You know, I mean, if you're shooting a movie in a house, you spend a lot of time on curtains because curtains are the last details. For him, it's like, you know, how does the horse eyes blink? You know, it's like things like that which shows dedication. And my God, you can't take away that from anyone. You waiting, huh? First of all, my hat went off to Kiefer for really throwing his full weight into it and, and bringing it and submitting himself to the process and understanding who the character was and allowing it to breathe. Uh, what I think he's done with these characters, and specifically the character that I got to play, uh, this is a man who's going to do the right thing for the right reasons. He's not doing it for money. He's not doing it for glory. Uh, this is a character who has a very strong sense of 
right and wrong and is going to do things uh, according to that. And he's being confronted with circumstances that are beyond uh, any one man's capability. Now go. Let the legend come back to life. I also freaked out because I got to see basically my face on Ocelot. And for me as an actor, for me as a fan, it was huge. Now I'm playing um, Miller, and uh, you know, and what a fantastic role uh, to be cast in. Miller has a lot of vulnerable uh, moments in The Phantom Pain, um, obviously with what's happened to him physically and mentally. Metal Gear Solid V is a darker game. It's the musically, as I say, it's a departure. I produced the music, Justin Burnett's created some of the music for this. Um, the story turns pretty damn dark. It's gonna be super dark, you know, it's a lot darker. The Phantom Pain, it's kind of scary, you know, it's sort of a, it's a much darker vision. You're definitely gonna see some fun, fun stuff in uh, The Phantom Pain. It's, it's like a movie. It's really like a movie. One of the interesting things about Kojima, which I very much related to, is that we're both very family men, you know? We, we live very mundane lives with our children and our wives. We don't have a very exciting everyday spectaculars, but our imagination and fantasies, you know, travel where no man has gone before. I guess the legacy would be like, continually subverted people's expectations in a good way. As, as I've seen Metal Gear Solid V, people better watch out, because that's gonna do something different again. I think Hideo Kojima and Metal Gear have influenced other creators to experiment more and try things that are outside of the box. If creators, you know, chase a vision that they really believe in, that will resonate with fans and it'll be evident in the final product. Well, I mean, a lot of people think of Kojima as the Metal Gear Solid guy, but in fact, he's a lot broader than that. Metal Gear Solid is one of the most important things. The body of Metal Gear work, the art of Metal Gear, is very, and, and very impressive to me and what Hideo Kojima has dedicated his life to. It's kind of a noble thing. Kojima to me, 100% pure respect. That's it. That's it. You know, and I am, I'm very honored to have a chance to work with him, and I'm very honored to be stay close friend with him. You know, he's a very special person to me, and special person to the fans all over the world.